Hello, and welcome to tonight's episode of The Bottom Line on Air. My name is Claire Sullivan, your host. Each week, we will explore our campus's current events and breaking news stories. Tonight, we are celebrating Earth Day with our guest, Tracy Edwards, coordinator of the Sustainability Studies minor, local activist and student, Laurel Plitnik, who recently became an official Global EcoBrick Alliance trainer, and Dr. Thomas Cadenazzi, who is helping FSU launch the Life Cycles Facility Management major as part of an emerging field aimed at balancing new construction and environmental goals. Our first guest is Tracy Edwards, coordinator of the Sustainability Studies minor and a lecturer in the Department of Geography. Her students have been at the forefront of numerous sustainability initiatives, including establishing a food recovery network chapter at FSU. She has helped students attend the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in higher education conferences as well. Tracy, happy Earth Day and thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So uh, you wear many hats on campus, but one of your most important roles is as the sustainability studies coordinator. And often you push your students not just to study sustainability, but to create action. Uh, what are some of the current and most recent projects that you have encouraged your students to pursue? Right now this semester, we began by surveying the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. and the class was encouraged to think about how we could be taking action towards meeting those goals just by looking around us locally here in campus or on the community. And the students then came up with some initiatives that they felt were really important right now on campus. There are four big projects underway right this semester. Um, one is dealing with aspects of period poverty and the sometimes frustrating um, reality that we don't have easy access to tampons and pads in our bathrooms. And oftentimes this creates real problems for students that need those items. That's a big thing right now. Um, another big issue does deal with the food recovery network because with COVID and all the changes in campus dining, as well as with new rules tied to bans and student availability also, our food recovery network chapter on campus is currently inactive. So trying to get all those initiatives restarted is one of the big focus areas. Um, a third deals with a, an idea, a proposal that we need to start an FSU trails committee mm -hmm. to make it so that students were using our campus outdoor spaces more frequently, but also that students that come here to Frostburg State, recognizing that we are like a campus that's blessed with being in this environment where we are, yet there's very little on campus that presents the statewide, you know, parks, the really local places that students could go to, to be outside. And, you know, so just trying to bring more information about what's around us close by is those are probably the big initiatives. Those projects cover a number of topics like equity and addressing hunger and responsible consumption. So how did you develop that curriculum? Well, a lot of the curriculum this semester, you know, I did, I do use the UN Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. quite frequently because a lot of people do believe that sustainability is related to only environmental concerns, but, um, you know, environmental, economic, social justice, social equity issues, they, they can't be solved without interrelating and considering all of the others. So that is one of the big missions of the sustainability studies minor is to kind of challenge that pretty prominent existing assumption that sustainability is all about recycling. Yes, it is, but sustainability is all about, you know, removal of inv invasive species. Yes, it is, but there's so many other components you know, of what our students deal with, which is one of the reasons that, you know, the sustainability studies minor is interdisciplinary in its scope. And the more broad the students that come into the courses and into the, into the minor, you know, the, the more effective I think we are in being able to draw to all of, from all those different skill sets that the students from different majors bring in. Right, okay, so, uh, what are some of the ways that you think FSU students can incorporate sustainability like into their everyday lives, um, especially those living in the residence halls? 
living in the residence halls on campus, I know from my own experiences, when I was blessed with the opportunity to live in a residence hall, you, you were kind of confronted with so many challenges just in your, in your life. It's the first time that you're taking on a lot of the responsibilities of life, you know, on your own, but at the same time, you're not fully independent. So you do still have the ability to make some choices. I do know that, um, in the different dining halls, there's variations in terms of if there are kitchens available, how convenient is the recycling? You know, mm-hmm. what options do I have in terms of transportation to purchase food items? Mm-hmm. You know, like, so I think that especially when dealing with students living in, in dorms, working with residents life to try to promote, you know, easier access to a variety of food choices for students, allowing them to not only um, be able to make their own food, but a lot of students have brought up the issue of wanting some campus composting Mm -hmm. options available outside of dorms. Some Mm -hmm. students come here where they're used to cooking and dealing with leftover food and putting it in a compost spot at their homes, but Mm -hmm. they come here to Frostburg State, live in a dorm, and they don't have the ability to do that. So those, I think, are just some ways, but overall, just being active and within the dorms to make sure students are aware where basic things like recycling are happening and making sure we have access to reliable transportation, like students to be able to get to the things that they need, you know, are good ways to make a difference. Right, right. So uh, last question. Uh, If students are on the fence about adding the sustainability studies minor to the graduation plan, uh, what would you say to them? And uh, in what ways would the minor help say uh, like an economics major or someone even in the performing arts? I, earlier I mentioned that the greater or the broader that the majors that come into the minor, the broader that is, the, the more effective that the minor and the students seem to be in getting things done. I like to think that in our disciplines, we're exposed to content. You know, we as um, art majors are introduced to aspects tied to photography and drawing, you know, and all the various different options there. As science major, you know, as biology majors, you're introduced to various different types of species. Whenever you're dealing with a sustainability class, you're interested in topics like how can we promote um, greater outdoor experiences for people so that the relationship between a human and nature, you know, is kind of enhanced. A lot of times when we have art students working together with science students, working together with marketing majors, working together with students that have a lot of journalistic skills, they're able to come up with methods of communication and that help them not only make more of a difference here on our campus by developing really cool initiatives, but also just seeing how their skill set can be applied in advocacy potentials outside of graduation. You know, so I just think being able to see how your own skill set can be used to make things better, you know, in whatever area it is that you're most interested in. I think that's, you know, dealing with advocacy and action and getting involved and seeing what more can I do with the skill set I've picked up. You know, that I think is the real draw and the real pull, hopefully, to get people interested in the minor. I think uh, this has been uh, an extremely insightful conversation. Tracy, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, We wish you a very happy Earth Day. And we are really looking forward to seeing the projects uh, from the Sustainability Studies minor. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Our next guest is Laurel Plitnick, a native of Western Maryland, who, among other notable achievements, recently spoke at the global climate strike held on FSU's campus. Today, Laurel is here to tell us about uh, becoming an official global eco brick alliance trainer and other initiatives that she is spearheading at Prospect State. Uh, welcome, Laurel, and thank you for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, so break down for us uh, what a Global EcoBrick Alliance trainer is and what is the benefit of creating EcoBricks from single-use plastics? So let me first start by explaining what the Global EcoBrick Alliance is. That is a network of people all around the world from individuals to entire communities that have the common goal of sequestering plastic from the biosphere. 
So as a Global Eco Brick Alliance trainer, you are a trained eco bricker to help jumpstart these projects and this goal all around for individuals and or communities to help keep the plastic out of all environments. And the benefit of creating eco bricks from single use plastics is simply to help stop this plastic problem that is all over the world. Um, so from creating an eco brick, the plastic is out of any environment that it was in and it is now turned into a useful product that can be um, used to sequester more plastics and provide homes, provide anything for an individual or community. This particular eco brick concept was developed in the Philippines and the Alliance says that they are deeply influenced by the success the indigenous people there had with eco bricking. However, the idea seems to have evolved from merely creating useful products from re refuse to, uh, uh, to an attempt to sequester carbon. So what are some of your goals for FSU in terms of using eco bricking to meet our, campus, uh, our campus's strategic goals related to sustainability and global climate change? Well, plastic waste is a huge problem everywhere in the world. And um, especially in FSU, one of the goals is to reduce waste production. And with eco bricking, the long term goal is to basically sequester more waste than you are putting out. So with eco bricking, the whole goal is to keep plastics out of the environment and by bringing that to FSU, Frostburg will long-term goal hopefully be taking in more plastics and waste than they are producing. And um, eco bricking is a great thing for this because it is a community project. It is not just a single person and or a behind the scenes thing. It's the whole group effort that can help this whole problem. Great. So uh, there are only about 300 trainers qualified to teach others how to create eco -brooks. So how did you become involved? So I originally um, was introduced with eco bricking when I went on a volunteer trip um, in South Africa. And the eco brickers there were not part of the Global Eco Brick Alliance, but when I was introduced to eco bricking, I was immediately fascinated. And um, when I came back to the United States, then I wanted to take this further, not just uh, some project I did on some volunteer trip. So I started eco bricking on my own for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then my instructor, Tracy Edwards, mm -hmm. uh, found out about it and I told her about it. And she was also immediately just very excited about this idea. And so the two of us brought it to her classroom, her sustainability class um, in the fall semester of 2020. And we really didn't have plans to become like a certified Global Eco Brick Alliance trainer at the time, but we figured if we wanna bring this project more widespread than just a classroom and we wanna bring it campus wide, then it would probably be, be good for us to be officially certified as a Global Eco Brick Alliance trainer um, so that we can really jumpstart this whole project not only campus-wide, but maybe even community-wide. Wonderful. So uh, what are some of the products or projects that you envision using eco bricks for on Frostburg's campus? So there are two types of really, two methods of building eco bricks. Um, there is open space eco bricks, which are used primarily indoors, and there is earth building eco bricks, which are outdoor structures. I actually am envisioning both types 
of structures at FSU. With the open space structures, there can be chairs, tables, um, there's even a couch that is possible to be made out of an eco brick. So I see those structures possibly in CCIT, in the Lane Center. Mm -hmm. um, Tracy Edwards actually has an idea to build a chair out of eco bricks for her office. And then with the earth building method, um, what can be done with that is to make a, just an example, a raised bed rain garden. Mm -hmm. um, you can make walls out of it. You can make benches outside. Mm -hmm. So I see all of these as feasible products from EcoBricks, um, not only around uh, the FSU campus, but we even had the idea to bring EcoBricks to the Gap Trail and making a bench on the Gap Trail. That sounds great. So one uh, last question for you, Laurel. While addressing climate change will require structural changes in terms of like manufacturing and public policy, from the perspective of a climate activist such as yourself, what is one thing members of our community can do to make a difference? Is it as simple as recycling or signing petitions or what else can we be doing? Yes. So. Um... Recycling and signing petitions is definitely a good thing to do, but it's not going to make that difference that we all really want to see. Um, when I think of recycling, I think of that as like a quick and dirty solution that really doesn't get the job done. Um, as I've said before, recycling is not the solution to the plastic problem. Um, so if if we really want to make a difference with the plastic problem, we have to get to the source of it, which is really refusing the plastics in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to make a difference with fuel consumption, say we need to refuse um, the production of this fuel in the first place. Um, so for someone in the community to make a difference, what they really need to do is to stop being complacent with these norms um, because it's very normal for us, for us to just use these plastics, use this fuel um, without thinking about it. So if someone wants to make a difference, they don't need a whole bunch of people to help them with this project on their own, really. They can refuse these problems from the beginning and change their lifestyle to be a more environmentally conscious lifestyle that will make more of a difference in the long run. That's a uh, great, uh, good, very good advice. Thank you. Uh, Laurel, it has been an absolute pleasure to hear about the Global Eco Brick Alliance and what projects that you guys are working on. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about and really good insight. Uh, happy Earth Day, and thank you again for being here. Thank you so much. Our final guest is Dr. Thomas Kadanasi, Program Coordinator of the new Bachelor in Life Cycle Facilities Management Program at FSU. The major, a climate change and emergency, emergency preparedness oriented discipline, seeks to promote energy efficiency and environmental quality uh, perspectives within the realm of construction and design. We are so glad to have you, Dr. Kadanazi, uh, being here to break it all down for us. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. This is really exciting. And uh, I thank you for inviting me. So the life cycle facilities management bachelor at Frostwood State, it's really focused on uh, green building. It's really a sustainable construction management program with, I would say, a lot of potential. Um, say if you're a student and you're interested in the uh, environmental sciences, but at the same time you wish to secure a spot uh, in the construction industry and in the manufacturing industry, uh, the life cycle facilities management uh, bachelor is really for you. Now, uh, the key of the program lies within the, the title itself. Uh, if you want, we can break it down together. We have uh, basically 
three keywords uh, here. Uh, life cycle, which is really the uh, focus on uh, sustainability. Life cycle, meaning that in the construction industry nowadays, we have uh, to build for the long term. We realize that we can't build for the short term anymore and go and maintain structures and infrastructure is just not feasible. We have to find ways to uh, design, build and manage for the long term. And we can do that nowadays. So that's the real focus on uh, sustainability. And the second keyword that you have there is uh, facilities, mm -hmm. which uh, really refers to any kind of uh, building uh, structure or infrastructure uh, where you would have the, uh, the true application of uh, the science. And then uh, the third, third keyword there is uh, management. Uh, um, at the end, we are speaking of the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So our future graduates will become leaders and managers and pioneers for the uh, sustainable construction and manufacturing business. So really uh, strategic figures within the role of project management. So why is this particular major needed? Like, in other words, uh, why not continue to let construction management professionals do what they do uh, and let environmental specialists do what they do? Uh, what is achieved by melding these two fields together? This is a very interesting question. I thank you for that. Uh, you know, nowadays, especially in our construction sector, we are very focused just on what we do. Uh, we're focused on our little space and we don't think of uh, the consequences of our action. We don't think of uh, the bigger picture. We just uh, think that, uh, as you're saying, there are environmental uh, scientists, environmental experts that would come and eventually fix our problems. They will come uh, and magically, just like that, fix the environment. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, uh, that is already too late. Things should start, I would say, at a, before that, at the decision-making process, when managers and uh, decision-makers sit on a table and they decide how to build things. Okay, how we are going to build this and with what? That is where you can actually define if a, uh, if a project will be sustainable or not. And uh, I always believe that uh, building is making art because uh, obviously you do it for a need, but uh, building is art. Uh, we make appealing and uh, very aesthetically uh, beautiful uh, architectural shapes, but what is truly missing in the end, it's uh, the, the focus on sustainability, which is the important factor, building with an attention to the environment. And this is what we uh, propose to do uh, with the LCFM here at Frostburg. This is why uh, it's so unique and so special. And in a sense, uh, you know, we are not reinventing the wheel. Because uh, if you look at what's up, what was happening 2,000 years ago, for example, with the Romans, uh, you go to Italy and you still see these beautiful infrastructures, these beautiful uh, structures that are still there. And imagine like, when they were building uh, arc stone bridges, uh, that was a big innovation back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were doing it also in a sustainable way because they were using uh, the natural resources that were available to them back then, They're, the resources that may, Mother Nature provided to them, stones, uh, sand, and uh, seawater, uh, which is really uh, the definition of sustainability, I would say. So then we, the history, with the history we evolved, and then uh, mass production kicked in. We started uh, building faster at a very fast rate and trying to contain all with the cost, so minimizing the cost, which is great. But uh, along the way, we just forgot uh, the focus on sustainability, which is uh, the third ingredient, I would say, that is most important. If we can go and see still what uh, they did 2,000 years ago, it's because those uh, were sustainable. There's no other reason. Uh, so we should uh, uh, think of that and add this third component into the, the equation when we build our structures. And this is what we teach uh, uh, here at Frostburg State with the LCFM program. Uh, it's very exciting. I would say there's a lot of 
incredible opportunities for students at the end of the four years. Uh, exciting for them, but I would say also exciting for us as a university because eventually uh, we can be pioneers with this new program for other universities to uh, take on the example uh, of our program that is truly uh, the future of construction management. Uh, what role does life cycles facility management play in combating climate change, both preventatively and as conditions worsen? So. Here we would have to talk a bit about the underlying reasons of why our climate is changing. And we have two leading factors, I would say. We have a number of factors, but two leading ones. And one is uh, the, the, the fact that we have um, too much greenhouse gases emissions, like carbon dioxide as number one. And then uh, basically what we scientifically call the acidification problem that has to do with uh, what, what we call commonly smog formation. Now the, together, the building operations and the construction are responsible for nearly the 40% of all carbon emissions in the world. 40% of all the uh, CO2 emissions are due to construction. This means that we cannot really solve the problem of uh, climate change if we don't change the way we do construction. Mm -hmm. We all want a better environment, but then when it comes to build, we just do it wrong, or at least we, we use the wrong materials and uh, we, we use the wrong practices, we just do it wrong. We also waste a lot in the construction business. Uh, they estimated the percentage of uh, the total solid waste caused by construction to be the 23% of the overall solid waste in the United States. And this is almost a fourth of uh, all the solid waste. And it doesn't even account for the, uh, the waste of water. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the construction, the, the most important construction material is concrete. And one of the ingredients to make concrete, uh, it's water. And we use fresh water. Uh, this is, uh, um, we have actually uh, more globally, more than 2 billion tons of water that is used for making concrete. This is approximately the 9% of all the global industrial water demand. So we should do something. Why do we use fresh water? Why we just uh, waste it like that? Why can't we use seawater instead? Obviously we can't as long as we use steel reinforcement. So the question should be, why do we keep on building with steel when we know first of all the damage that it does to the environment at production phase? And then we know that it corrodes and uh, <laughs> no matter what you do, steel will corrode. Why do we keep on using a technology that belongs to the 19th century when today we have more sustainable materials, more durable, and twice as stronger as steel. I'm referring to fiber reinforced polymers, for example, or in general, composite materials. Mm -hmm. It's just, I think, my belief is that we don't have the managers and uh, people, decision makers in the construction industry that know how to deploy these kind of materials. We have the resources, it's just a matter of how can we use them? Do we know how to use them? We need managers that, uh, will serve for tomorrow. And things can change if we can educate the new generation of managers. And this is the purpose of the LCFM. So um, for students who uh, are interested in learning more about your department and these, discussing the employment opportunities for life cycle facility managers, how can they reach out to you? Definitely by mail. Uh, my email address uh, is uh, T Cadenazzi, T as my first name, Thomas, and Cadenazzi, my last name, at frostburg.edu. And uh, um, they can also uh, look at the website. I invite them to take a look at our website at www.frostburg.edu slash LCFM. Uh, so that is all the time we have this evening for you.
Kevin Mazzi. Uh, it has been so exciting to hear about the soon to be launched program and the many applications of the life cycle facilities management. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We want to thank our guests, Tracy Edwards, Laurel Plitnick, and Dr. Thomas Kevin Mazzi for joining us to celebrate the 51st annual Earth Day. Uh, do make some time tomorrow to enjoy the outdoors and reflect on what you can do to support planetary health. Next week's episode will feature Dr. Mackenzie Lamont and Scott Raker, two faculty members from the music department who will tell us about the upcoming choral and percussion concert. Student Jasmine Acarolo, who recently founded a chapter of the Center for Economic and Social Justice. And finally, former Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Tom Bowling, who is leading a global civic literacy and leadership program on campus. So tune in next Wednesday, April 28th at 8 p.m. for that episode. This show is a collaboration between FSU TV3 and The Bottom Line. To stay connected with us, you can find The Bottom Line at thebottomlinenews.com and on Facebook and Twitter. FSU TV3 can also be found on social media and at frostberg.edu slash FSU TV3. Thank you for joining us. My name is Claire Sullivan, and this has been The Bottom Line on Air. Good night. Mm -hmm.